The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus summoned the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey but a walking stick, no food, no sack, no money in their belts. They were, however, to wear sandals, but not a second tunic. He said to them, Whoever, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave. Whatever place does not welcome you or listen to you, leave there and shake the dust off your feet in testimony against them. So they went off and preached repentance. The twelve drove out many demons, and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. A story, I can assure you, you did not hear this week on CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, or MSNBC. Did I leave anything out? Okay. A German regional court, which is equivalent, I understand, in weight, John, to the West Virginia State Supreme Court, issued a law recently forbidding citizens to have their infant males circumcised. And they gave two reasons. Reason number one was it was hazardous to infants. Well, Rabbi Goldschmidt, who is over the European Rabbinic Association, said, what do you mean hazardous? We've been doing it for 4,000 years. Keep on circumcising. But secondly, and I've heard this argument so many times from parents. You wait until the child's old enough to make the decision as to whether or not they want to be circumcised. And so something amazing happened. There was a silver lining to this story. Two groups who never have anything to do with one another and in fact despise one another. Jews and Muslims, their leadership came together in protest against the German government. And guess what? The German government backed down. What I'm saying to you is this. That was an affront on religious, religious liberty. You know, when we think of religious persecution, we think about people throwing hand grenades into a church in northern Nigeria and spraying the congregation with AK-47 fire. Yeah, that's persecution, all right. When they line up a whole family on the way to Mass in Iraq and shoot them execution style in the back of the head, that's religious persecution, all right. But in Germany, a friendly country, for goodness sake, they were attacking the religious liberty of those who carry out the practice of circumcision, especially Jews, for goodness sake, and especially in post-World War II days, for goodness sake. Do you see how it could happen here in America? How our own government is attacking the Catholic Church and attempting to take away our religious liberty by forcing me as an employer to pay for abortion-inducing drugs for our employees. That's what the government can do, and we have to be prepared. Now, you can cuss and fuss and spit at the wind and do all kinds of stuff and say, it ain't fair, it ain't fair, it ain't right, but the question we need to ask instead is how did it get to this point? How did it get this way that, that it could happen? That the federal government would actually threaten the Catholic Church in America? That the government in Germany, a friendly nation, would actually attempt to take away the freedom of its religious practicing citizens? How did it get that way? Well, if I told you in Germany, the number of people who attend mass on a regular basis has fallen to single digits, would it surprise you? What about Spain, single digits? France, was, which was known as the first daughter of the Catholic Church throughout history, 
single-digit mass attendance on weekends. There's your first clip, and that brings us to our gospel. A passage found in Luke chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, and of course here in Mark chapter 6. The storyline is very simple. Jesus sends out his apostles in twos in order to witness to the kingdom. But notice what happens. He warns them ahead of time. Beware. Be careful. Everybody's not going to stand up and cheer and say, Yay! Jesus' disciples are here. Mm, we love you. No, no, no. He says, there are going to be people who are going to refuse to listen to you. And how do you treat them? You take off your sandals and you shake your dust in their faces as a sign of testimony against them. What does that mean, shaking dust off one's sandals? Pious Jews during Jesus' day were expected, if they ever traveled to Gentile territory, when they came back to the Holy Land, they were to shake the dust as a way of saying, I am leaving heathen territory and coming back to holy territory, the land of Israel. And it was also meant to be a sign of judgment, a way of saying, look, you better change your ways. You better turn your lives around and start believing. And so Jesus is telling them to make that sign with the view that maybe, just maybe, Someone else may go behind them, witness to the gospel, and they'll change their hearts subsequently. But for now, the message is very stark. Be prepared for persecution and rejection and respond accordingly. Now, how did it get to the point in the United States of America, the greatest, most prosperous nation on planet Earth, how did it get to the point where our own government is attempting to take away our religious freedom as Catholics? How did it get to that point? Okay, here we go. Number one, affluency. Affluency. We are the most prosperous nation on planet Earth, which leads very often, unfortunately, to materialism. And here's what happens. When we are so bloated with stuff, all of a sudden, we don't need to look up. We look in the mirror at ourselves. And it's pleasure, it's enjoyment. Party up life, eat, drink, and be merry, because that up there that may just be a story that your grandparents told you years ago. Something interesting happened, a study came out just recently that stunned me, really stunned me actually. The divorce rate in the United States for years has been at the 50% level. In one demographic, one shocking demographic, the divorce rate has climbed to 70%. You know what age group that is? The baby boomers. People born like myself, between the years 1946 and 1964. They are divorcing at the 70% rate in this country. They've been married 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and they are divorcing. The question why? Because they can afford to. They can afford to. What do you mean there's no poor baby boomers? Yes, there are less than fortunate baby boomers out there, but something I learned a number of years ago, the God and country generation, I call it, the people who lived and fought during World War II and the Korean War, have passed on to the baby boomers. Are you ready for this? This will shock you. One trillion dollars in wealth. That's trillion with a T. I know they throw that number around a lot in Washington, D.C. these days. One trillion dollars has been passed on to baby boomers from the generation before. They are therefore bloated. They are bloated and materialism has become their God. Reason number two is actually philosophical. There's been a shift in thinking. What is truth? 
What is reality? To the generations before, truth and reality came from God. The commandments were commandments. The Constitution of the United States was the fundamental document of our country. That has changed. From the 60s forward, we entered a philosophy called subjective relativism, which basically says, truth is what I say it is. There's nothing objective out there. Don't go look into the heavens. Don't go look into a bunch of stupid things on stove tablets called commandments. And so the commandments ceased to be law to be obeyed and became recommendations or suggestions. The Constitution, we need to revise it, rethink it. It's too old. It doesn't fit today. And so judges have been legislating from the benches for years rather than building on what went before us. Relativism. And so if my opinion is what counts, what if you tell me that there's a God? Why should I even believe you? That's your opinion. And if you want to have that delusional thinking, good for you. Karl Marx said, after all, religion's nothing more than an opiate for the people. So you're just kind of drinking Kool-Aid. Thirdly, and this one makes me furious, bad teaching. Bad teaching since the 60s. From whom? Priests, sisters, bishops, deacons, brothers, and even laypersons. Bad teaching. You all were subjected to bad teaching. Fortunately, I can say for myself, I had the Palatine sisters and they were incredibly faithful to the church in her teachings. But we had some whacked out teachers out there teaching some absolutely perverted things. Abortion, for instance, was a debatable issue. It wasn't wrong under all circumstances. There could be situations where abortion needs to be allowed. Uh, rare situations, but it needs to be allowed. What would be a case? Well, a mother with five kids whose husband loses his job, she loses her job due to unemployment, and there they are floundering, and she finds herself pregnant. That's going to be too much pressure for the family, so let's do a little snip-snip here, and we take care of it. Out of sight, out of mind. First trimester abortion, no big deal. Oh, yeah? A few years ago, it was the early evening during the week one day, and there was a, 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 a knock at the door, the rectory. I came to the door, and it was a priest. He was a few years older than me. And I said, what, what can I do for you? He said, I'm just passing through town. He said, i got to do a funeral service downtown. He said, do you have a rosary? And I said, or Our Lady of Fatima. That's what we're for. We have rosaries here. We're the rosary church in Huntington, you know? And I thought to myself, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I forget things, you forget things, we think you get keys, you forget your rosary. What's no problem, no problem. So I went and got him a rosary. Lord knows I had plenty next door. But it was what he asked for the next that shocked me. He said, do you have one of those cards that has how to pray the rosary on it? And I said to myself, you don't know the prayers of the rosary? You went to the seminary too? But you see, at my seminary, they didn't teach the rosary. In fact, they considered you as too conservative if you prayed the rosary. We had to go underground to pray the rosary. I don't mean dig a hole and go under the ground. We had to hide. Why? They would write you up as being too conservative. Too conservative. We threw away a lot of our great liturgy things in the 60s and 70s, especially the music, and we replaced it with very trite, secular tunes. I'll never forget in the seminary, we were talking about a composer by the name of Cary Landry. Uh, I think he's retired now, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing that he's retired. He wrote a song one time called Here We Are. It was a gathering song for the opening of Mass, you know, when the priest comes down the aisle. And hear how the song went. Now, can you imagine in this church you hear the following tune, all right? 
first of all, the, the, the person, the cantor, would say, please stand as we greet our celebrant. And then all of a sudden you hear, are you ready for this? Are you ready? Okay. Here we are, all together just to sing our song joyfully. Here we are, all together just to sing our song joyfully. Makes you feel holy, doesn't it? Yeah. That polluted our church hymnals for a good 30 years to 40 years or so. That kind of music. They really had nothing sacred attached to it. You know, if I want to hear a secular tune, I listen to it either leaving Mass or coming to church. But you see, there were years and years of that kind of thinking that went through where our young people were not taught the teachings of the church. The next thing, intellectual snobbery. And I saw it a lot when I was going to Catholic U in the Washington Beltway area, but I also saw it when I visited Boston, around Harvard Square and Harvard University, up through that area, that great intellectual center where MIT is close by as well. There was an intellectual snobbery, and here's what happened. The scientific method reigned supreme. If science couldn't validate it, then it didn't count. And so, in other words, the thinking was faith, <clears throat> faith, uh, prove it, prove it, demonstrate faith, demonstrate faith. So many people fell hook, line, and sinker for the scientific method, and the scientific method is important. I am a scientist. But science and faith were meant to cohabitate, to live together, to work together. But you see, the pure scientist said, <coughs> science, <coughs> well, if you little old ladies and little old men want to believe that stuff, God bless them, God bless them. And the kids, you know, the kids, you know, there's Jesus, Santa Claus, and the Easter Bunny. It just changes according to season. Really? Undergraduate classes. And I've worked with several students who went to Marshall, but it's everywhere. It's WVU, it's Marshall, it's all the schools. Undergraduate classes, how many times they encounter professors who will tell you at the beginning of the semester, I am an atheist. And you know what? They don't mitigate their teaching in light of that. They teach as atheists. And so these little darlings go off to, the po go off to colleges very impressionable. Uh, they're breaking away from their family's traditions and leaving the nest and going out into that big world out there. And they're exposed to all kind of destructionist thinking. But nobody gives them anything of substance to replace it. So plenty of bad teaching and intellectual snobbery. You're not a true intellectual if you're one of those faith people, you see. So when you shake all of those things up and you pour them together and then you pour it out into your glass and you say, what's this thing taste like? It tastes like something that is rising in this country. The new atheism. There was an article a month ago in one of my psychology journals that I read scrupulously. The article, the title of the article was The Atheist at the Breakfast Table. It was about the rise of what we call the new atheism. As distinguished from classical atheism. What's classical atheism? Well, you all know what it is. It's the people that you hear those stories that make you laugh. You know, that the city of Huntington puts up a manger scene and so somebody contacts the ACLU and sues the city of Huntington. You know, that kind of people. Those, those very loud cases that, that ABC, CBS, NBC, NBC, and all they, they love to pick up those stories, you know. But there's another atheism that's rising very quickly and finding acceptance among especially 30-somethings and 40-somethings. And here's what happens. They are people who sit in the pews of churches every Sunday. 
Every Sunday, they're coming to church with their family because it's important for the kids. But they come to the church and if you ask them, why are you here? You know, the music's cool. The music's cool. Love the way Archie sings. He's got a great bass voice. You know, the music's cool. It's happening. And, and the preacher, great motivational speaker. You know, everybody loves a give them, give them heck father, you know? Well, what do you believe about the Blessed Trinity? <laughs> what? The Blessed Trinity, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, what's your understanding of the presence of Christ in the Eucharist? Do you believe that Christ is really in the Eucharist? <laughs> no wonder Gallup, back in the 90s, did a study on Catholics in America. One of the questions they asked, do you believe in the presence of Christ in the Eucharist? Only 33% of Catholics in America believe in the church's teaching on the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Is Gallup accurate in their research? Absolutely. See it all the time, hear it all the time. In the course of this article, they made a reference to a woman by the name of Wendy Thomas Russell. Wendy Thomas Russell. She's an author. She's an atheist, an avowed atheist. And she's kind of leaving a movement to help parents raise their children successfully as atheists. And the concern she was getting from some of her audience was, what do I say? What do I say when little Fru-Fru comes home from school and says, Mommy, Daddy, what's a church? What's a church? What do I say to them? And so she did some research and she wrote a book. It hasn't been published yet, but it's entitled, are you ready for this? Relax, it's only God. Relax, it's only God. And it's meant to be a catechism for atheists, so you can teach your little atheist children how to be good atheists. Now what's interesting, I did not know the book was not yet published. I, as soon as I saw the title, I said, I gotta have me a copy of that. So I went to my favorite source for buying books, I went to Amazon.com, and I put my thing in there, and I typed in the name Wendy Thomas Russell. And I found out her book wasn't published yet. But you know what else I found out? Are you ready for this? Hold on to your pacemaker. She has written numerous, are you ready for this? Are you ready? Numerous Girl Scout manuals. The Girl Scouts love her. They love her writing. Wendy Thomas Russell. Google her name. So your little brownie, your little daisy, is going to learn how to build a campfire and how to make peanut butter cookies when the power goes out. And Wendy Thomas Russell is teaching him how to do that. Ain't that special? That make you feel all warm and cozy inside? Yeah. So you put all that together, it's no wonder when Catherine Sebelius, who purports to be a practicing Catholic and is pro-abortion, even in late-term abortions, put this law into place requiring me as a Catholic employer to provide abortion services for our employees, the majority of Catholics initially said, oh, come on, it's not all that bad. Oh, come on, Sovis, you're just overreacting. It's not, you know, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Well, guess what, my friends? The alarm has been sounded. It is a big deal. This administration in D.C. is planning to take away our freedom as Catholics. The law is in place. It won't affect us to next August. Something's got to happen. But please remember, it didn't happen overnight. There was a gradual erosion in the spiritual and moral life in this country. Catholics forgot about their faith and stopped practicing their faith. Most Catholics who come to church on a regular basis, if they even come, know little about their Catholic faith. 
So the next question is, what are we going to do about it? Do we just curl up in a little ball and say, let me go live in the city of Rome next to the Vatican. I know I'll be okay there. No, don't go there because the Italian government's not friendly to the Catholic Church over there either. Let me tell you a story. I told this one back at our eighth grade graduation at Fatima. Some years ago, a news release told us some pelicans that were fishing off the coast of California. Working in that same area were fishing boats. The men on the boats were cleaning their catch and leaving the parts they couldn't sell, throwing them back into the ocean at the water's edge. The pelicans observed what was happening and decided they could just eat the waste without having to work for their food. So for weeks they sat waiting for the fishing boats to come. After a while, the fishermen discovered that the waste could be sold also. When they stopped dropping the fish waste into the sea, it caught the pelicans unprepared. They just sat there on the shore and waited. They grew thinner by the day and seemed to be able to do nothing about their sad plight. Why? The authorities concluded it was because they had forgotten how to fish. Then the wildlife officials hit upon a plan. They brought pelicans from another area to teach these poor starving birds how to fish again. Now, when I told our eighth graders this story, I was preparing them, as I always do, not for high school. High school is a piece of cake for our kids who graduate. I'm preparing them for college and graduate school because 100% of them will go there. And here was what I was trying to tell them. Be prepared when you go into your college dorm room, your college room, and you are in with another student or two. And they're lazy buns. They don't work. They don't do anything. The reason is mommy and daddy have been coddling them their entire lives. So once they're out of the nest, they go to college, why are they going to work? They still get a paycheck from home. But you know how to work. You were taught the importance of hard work at Fatima. So be like those good pelicans that mix among these kids and show them how to work again. The same thing applies to our faith. How do we change that? We take good Catholic pelicans who practice their faith and know their faith and we get them as active in that world out there as possible. People will see it, they will notice it, and they'll want to be a part of it because what the world is offering them bloats but does not satisfy. My brothers and sisters, we do not have time to waste. Germany was a vivid illustration of what can happen all around the world when friendly governments get occupied by people who have no faith. It's happening here in America. People who say they have faith and say they are Catholic, like Catherine Sebelius, are running our government. And they're going to make us do things that go against what we believe. We can't let that happen. We've got to change it all, and it's going to take time. So my brothers and sisters, get ready to shake a lot of dust off your feet. A lot of dust because there's going to be a lot of times when people are going to laugh at you, they're going to joke at you, they're going to say things behind your back and even to your face. Remember, you'll never get off worse than what Jesus did. He gave it all for us. Let us be prepared to do the same for him.